The year is 2025, and yes, there are still basic buffer overflows happening in software. A 9.8 severity CVE just got released for RSync, a widely loved piece of software that we'll talk about in this video. Now, if you don't know who I am, Hi, my name is Ed. I am an offensive security specialist. I'm a security engineer, TLDR, I'm a hacker. I've been looking for bugs and mitigating bugs in software for about 10 years now. This bug is super interesting to me because of how widely used this software is and how simple the bug is. The name rsync comes from remote sync, where you're able to specify between a client and a server that you wanna have a particular folder on your computer synced across two locations. Now, when I look at any bug or I wanna root cause any vulnerability, step one is you gotta figure out how the protocol works. I did some research on the protocol. The way that this works is that it walks the entire file system and creates a list of files that exist on both locations. So it iterates over every file and creates a list of checksums. Now, what those checksums allow you to do is they give you the speed that rsync is known for. Instead of sending the entirety of every file inside the folder that you want to sync, it runs these things called rolling sums. It breaks the file into these individual chunks. These chunks are being used to determine if that part of the file has changed on the remote server. You verify that the rolling sum and the checksum, if they have changed, it then transmits only the chunk of that file to the other end of the process. And doing this actually makes the rsync process extremely fast and extremely efficient. And this is why rsync has been loved so much over the years is that it is a protocol that only sends the necessary data with very minimal overhead. The vulnerability we're talking about today is actually due to an explicit issue in that checksum length handle. It's a heap buffer overflow flaw that is found that allows a remote attacker to overflow the contents of the heap and they can use use that to get remote code execution. This bug is a uh, very funny kind of comical mistake. As I was going through the code, trying to figure out the bug here, and I was looking at the report from OpenWall, I saw this line of code and I'm like, Sh surely they're not doing this, right? When the server is reading up the checksums from the client, rsync protocol is designed to not send entire files, to only send chunks of files. And the way that works is it sends up a checksum and compares that against the actual checksum of the file. And if they don't match, it sends that chunk. What's happening here is the server is reading up all the checksums from the client. And this read buff function is reading S2 length, the length of the buffer, into sum two. If you're in the world of hacking, if this is not news to you, you're probably thinking, oh, the reading into a buffer, that means that the length has to be controlled by the attacker. Case closed, that's the vulnerability. And that, that's exactly what I thought when I read this. I was like, oh, okay, that has to mean that S2 is a hacker controlled value. But something weird happened. S2 length actually does come off of the network and you'll see it happened right here. Um, S2 length is being set in this read sum head function. Uh, it's the checksum header at the header of the checksum data type. Uh, sum of S2 length is equal to either a default value or if the protocol version is after protocol 2.7, we're going to read an int off the wire. But you'll see here that we are validating that S2 length is not less than zero and that S2 length is not greater than some max digest length value, right? And that max digest length value is actually set in uh, this file here. It's being set to the maximum length of of a digest. So if we're using SHA-256s to do our checksums, it's gonna set the max di digest length to that value. When I tell you that I literally sat here and I just stared at this line for, I was just like, I'm sitting here and I'm like, what? like for, I was here for 30 minutes and I'm just like, they're checking the value. How is this a vulnerability? But if you go back and you read the open wall report, when max digest length exceeds the fixed sum length value, 16 bytes, and that's when the light bulb went off. So what is the problem? If we're if we're doing some validation on the length, we're checking for less than zero, we're checking for greater than some max value, what is the issue here? The issue is somewhat hilariously that the actual length of the buffer is not dynamically allocated. It is statically sized to a wrong value. You'll see that the sum length value here is actually just a hard pound to find of, it's just a hard pound to find of 16. So the bug is if you're using a checksum that is larger than 16, you are going to overflow a heap buffer. Now the question arises, how was this not caught? How have we not seen this before? I think the issue is because the sum buff structure is so small, 
over time, the sum buff structure probably got padded out by the heap. It probably added some padding bytes to the front of the heap to make it more efficient. And then as a result, like when this overflowed, you know, at most 48 bytes greater than it should have, no one really caught it. No one really cared. Maybe there were other structures in front of it that were string based. Maybe the, like there's a bunch of reasons why this could have gone unnoticed. Now, what is interesting about this bug is I've seen a lot of bugs in my time, right? A single buffer overflow is rarely enough to be able to actually knock a server over entirely, right? Now, don't forget, this is one of six CVEs that were found. The reason why a heap buffer overflow can't just be exploited on its own is you need to know a lot of other information about the system or have very fine grained control to do a bunch of corrupted writes and then do some reads to leak information out. Ah, but what if I told you that there was another vulnerability, uh, an info leak via uninitialized stack contents. So a flaw was found in the rsync daemon that can be triggered remotely when comparing file checksums. Another classic example of not bad coding, but just bad practice when it comes to variables on the stack, especially variables on the stack that will later be checked to do some kind of like very mem memory critical operation. Um, if you guys aren't aware, if you're not coding, when you make a variable on the stack in C like this, if another function has already occupied that space on the stack, right? So for example, we call function foo in main and main returns back to main. And then we call function bar from main and then we go back to main, right? While bar is executing, variables like this will maintain the value that they used to have in the same location in foo. Now, if that confused the crap out of you, what this effectively means is that this is going to have a random value. Now, random is an air quote. So it just means a value that was previously there and attack can use this value to leak information out of the stack. Effectively, there's a memory leak here that allows you to reveal information about the process. The problem with this is this bypasses a core mitigation in software called ASLR, address space layout randomization. If I have a program bin sh, right? What's happening in bin sh is the program has been randomized to sit at a random memory address. If I go to proc, uh, cat proc, self maps, right? The location of all of the binaries of all the libraries in my program have been set to a generally random location so that if there was a vulnerability in bin sh, that's a bad example, but if there's a vulnerability in the process, I wouldn't know where my code lives. So I couldn't return and do something malicious. Now by having a leak in generator.c, what this allows us to do is take information that was on the stack, which could be a pointer to the heap, which could be a pointer to a library, which could be a pointer to the stack elsewhere, and then construct an image of what the process image looks like, and then use that to exploit the heap overflow, right? To overflow that data with pointers to other things that could be put in there maliciously by a hacker. Now there are again, four other vulnerabilities. So a server leaks arbitrary client files by using specially constructed checksum values for arbitrary. What this one effectively is, is you are able to leak files out of the server by creating a checksum for every byte, like all two, five, six potential bytes, and then comparing the index of the file against that checksum and using that to leak the contents. It's a very interesting side channel analysis thing that isn't very practical, unlike the other two, but it is a vulnerability nonetheless, right? Uh, traditional path traversal, basically there is an issue with their uh, recursive option that I won't go into too deep, and then a time of check, time of use race condition in the way that it handles symbolic links. But it's interesting, it's called the time of check, time of use. When you have a vulnerability that's a race condition, what this effectively means is that there is a time delta between you, when you are checking a, a certain condition and when you're acting on it, right? So by default, rsync will not handle symbolic links, right? You will you are not able to either upload or download symbolic link files. And what that means is that when it checks for a certain file, it's saying, are you a symbolic link? Yes, okay, back off. Is if you check for a file, and you see that it is a regular file, there's some amount of time delta between that check and actually acting on it. And because of that, you can actually replace the file in that time with a symbolic link and then use that to leak other files off the computer. And then finally, this fifth one, uh, another issue with symbolic link traversal, not super important. But I just wanna say, you know, bugs happen. We are in 2025 and uh, basic buffer overflows continue to be an issue. Now, the heap, especially in uh, glibc, the glibc uh, PT malloc heap is one of the highly, the most protected heaps that is out there. Obviously there's a bypass for every protection almost, um, but you know, it's just, it is crazy we still have to deal with this. Now the question 
question on everyone's mind. Would Rust have caught this? The answer is yes, yes. Uh, this is one of the cases where a simple runtime uh, bounds check on an, on an array would have caught this. Now, it still turns the condition into a DOS, right? It is still a denial of service, so it's not like just a panacea where, you know, suddenly there are no issues with its software. It still could DOS it, um, but it would not allow this to be a condition that is remotely exploitable by a hacker. And then same thing with the info leak. Uh, Rust will always Rust has RAI, so basically like the access is initialization. Um, the ability for you to put a variable on the stack and it have the contents of the previous location on the stack is not a thing in Rust. So so these two bugs would have gone away. Um, this is a side channel based on the implementation of the protocol. So no, actually this would not have been solved by Rust. Um, this would not have been solved by Ross. This is a logic issue in their implementation of recursion. Same thing with the safe links. Uh, this is not gonna be solved by Rust. And then time of check, time of use. This actually, you could argue, could be exacerbated by Rust. What's critical about time of check, time of use vulnerabilities is the time between when you check and the time between when you use it. The longer that gets, the easier it is to actually do something evil in between there. And because of the overhead that Rust does add, not a ton, but it is there, um, this would definitely be easier to do, easier to exploit if this program were written in Rust. Anyway, guys, I hope you like these kinds of videos. I've been doing this like reactionary CVE React uh, content for a while. If you like this stuff, please let me know in the comments. I, I wanna make sure I'm making videos that you guys actually enjoy. If you're new here, hit subscribe. And then I did a similar breakdown on the seven zip vulnerabilities from a few months ago that I had a really good time uh, hacking. We did a lot of fuzzing and uh, we found the nature of the bug and wrote a little write up on it. So that's it for now, guys. I'll see you in the next one. Take care.